Iron City built. It's time for the Steel City Nation podcast. Here's your host, Mark Maraday. Uh, Steel City Nation, my guest today is Sean Springs from the Ohio State University, uh, Seattle Seahawks. Uh, he played with the Washington Redskins for a while. He was with the New England Patriots. Sean, how you doing tonight? Man, I'm making it, man. You know, Friday night, you know, just trying to stay out of the way, man. I'm very appreciative of having you on here uh, this evening. Um, I'm going to start out with this question for you right out of the gates. What was, it like, <laughs> what was it like having a father who played in the league? Was there pressure on you? You know what? It was. And, 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 and the pressure – wasn't that the pressure my dad put on me for uh, playing football and following his footsteps or people put on me. I think the pressure was more pressure. My dad was harder on me about school <laughs> and academics than he was about sports. Because I think at an early age, he recognized that I had talent. And so he, he just wanted to make sure that I didn't go off track and make sure that, you know, I, I was able to reach my full potential and and my dad, man, just he just stayed on me about that. You know, he put a lot of pressure on me just to do the right thing in life, be the best person I could be, not necessarily to follow in his footsteps or or be worried about if people think that, you know, because I was Ron Spring's son that I had to go to the NFL. Right. So you're being recruited out of Springbrook High School. You yep. got a bunch of people knocking at your door. Why'd you choose the Ohio State University over, like, say, Maryland, which is right down the road from where you live? Yeah, man. Hey, hey, don't bring Maryland up. That's a sore subject, man. You know, that Maryland's about 10 miles from my house uh, uh, where I grew up in my high school. Maryland didn't even recruit me, man. <laughs> I had Notre Dame, yeah, Michigan. Safe. I had Notre Dame, Michigan, and all the other schools in Maryland. They ain't really, I don't know, they, maybe they, they didn't see me like that. But one of the things, man, um, most people don't know I committed to the school up north, the University of Michigan. And on my way home, you know, the signing day was like February 8th. I never forget it. And right before, you know, you know, my dad came home. He was coaching at Howard. He came home. He said, let's go out to dinner. Let's celebrate that you're going to get a scholarship. You're going to sign with a school. And I told him what school I was going to go to. And then uh, at dinner, and my stepmom went to Ohio State. My dad went to Ohio State. He was a captain at Ohio State. And then right when we got to the uh, house in Maryland, there's snow on both sides of the Jeep and everything. My dad goes, uh, I'm going to tell you what, if you go to the University of Michigan, don't come in my house. <laughs> <laughs> so I had no Not choice. Right but there, that's it. Hey, 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 hey that, that, you know, that's pre-cell phone, man. I think, you know, people have pages. I didn't have that, but I'm just telling you, that that's pre-cell phone days. Ain't like you could go, where you going to go, right? So you, what, Bo Schembeck, uh, Schembechler was there then? Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, no, you know, no, no, it was uh, Coach Gary Moeller. Oh, Moeller, that's right. Yeah, hey, Coach Gary Moeller was recruiting me. Wow. So, yeah. That was it. You, you wanted to go back in Dad's house a little bit. You, you didn't want to have that distance. I, yeah. I, I get it. I mean, you made a good choice, obviously, right? It worked out for me, man. You know, at the time, you know, we, we was getting it rolling at Ohio State, and, you know, I had some great teammates from Eddie George, Orlando Pace, Dan Jackson, Terry Glenn, Joey Galloway, Big Daddy, Ricky Dudley, Mike Vrabel. So we had it rolling at Ohio State. Yeah. Think, Antoine, Antoine Winfield, you know, so. Think yes, about players. the names you just dropped right there. I mean, that's a serious squad right there. That's a serious group of people right there. I mean, you got NFL coaches now right in that group. and, and yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so in high school, you played a little bit of everything. You were like Mr. Everything on that squad down there. Yep. Why'd you choose to be a corner? They say, hey, Sean, we're going to have him put you out here. My, my, my dad, man, I, I, I wanted to play running back, but my dad said, you know what? You know, he was a forward thinking. He was just like running backs, man, you know, take a lot of pounding, a lot of take, take a lot of hits. The money in the game is going in the direction of you need corners who can cover these big, strong, fast receivers. And my dad was like, man, return kicks and punts. And if you really want the ball, when they throw it to the receiver, go get it. <laughs> right? That's it. That's it. Like, you want the ball? You want to score a touchdown? Go get it, right? That's it. 
Uh, what's your most, your most memorable moment at Ohio State? Like, you had a lot of big-time moments there. I know you. Yeah, I, I think my most memorable moment is the 97 Rose Bowl. Most people remember that game because we were able to come back at the last minute and beat Jake Plummer, Jake the Snake. And, uh, and, and, and you know now, you know, they got the BCS playoff series a little different in college football. But at that time, playing in the Rose Bowl was everything, right? Yeah. You know, you know, you know, you playing the, the, the Pac-12 and you at the Big Ten and playing in the Rose Bowl was everything. I mean, they talk about the pageantry of the Rose Bowl with the parade, yeah. and you know, it, it, it's uh, that's one of my favorite games to watch every year when I'm watching the bowl games. I'm yeah, watching the Rose Bowl. Um, at what point in your college career did you recognize that you were going to be one of the top dogs chosen in the draft that year in '97? What point in my college career? Yeah, like when when, when you were getting through there. What, when did you realize, man, I'm playing some good ball here. I think I'm going to be okay here in this draft. Well, I, 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 let me say this. I think I knew probably about halfway through my, my true freshman year that I had a shot because, you know, there was a kid, he was a junior, uh, they enjoyed Galloway, and he kept calling me out. And it was guys who were older than me, and I was a freshman, but he wanted to go against me every day. And, and, I, and I got redshirted, but... Halfway during the year, they wrote an article and said, you know, Ohio State might have – he's not playing, but he, they might have the best defense back to ever hit the school's program. And and everybody was like, man, that was a great article on you. And I was like, there was an article written on me. I don't even play. I'm a bench one. <laughs> right. I'm like fourth, I'm fourth on a depth chart. But I didn't realize that how, you know, me just be able to stay close to Joy Galloway you know, how good I had to be to be in, in, in this atmosphere at the time, especially being a true freshman. So, and then by the time my junior year, I was, you know, when I was playing in the games, everybody else seemed slow and they couldn't even compare to what I was seeing in practice with Terry and Joey. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, and I mean, both of them went on to have pretty stellar careers at the next level. Um, not to say yep. anything less about you because you definitely did. Um, what was it like on draft night for you? Like, that had to be fun. Draft night had to be fun, knowing where you were headed. Well, I, I didn't know, man. It was nerve-wracking a little bit. Um, the night before I got a call, they said that St. Louis had, had moved up to the first pick. They traded with the Jets to move up to the first pick, and they were going to draft Orlando Pace. And then I scrambled the draft, right? I, you know, I didn't know if I was going to go to Oakland at the second pick or Seattle the third pick or if I would fall to Baltimore at the fourth pick. But to your point, I knew I was going somewhere in the top five. And you're still what? The highest drafted cornerback in the first round ever? Yeah. My boy Jeffrey Akuda tied me this year. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, he still got to perform, though. You perform. <laughs> you perform. He you're, not giving it, you're, you're not giving it to him just yet, huh? Not yet, baby. Not yet. He's got to play a couple seasons, more than a couple seasons, because you did it over and over and over. Uh, enjoyable to watch um so when you got to seattle the pressure on you the pressure on you to step on that field and perform right away for that squad yeah you know the expectations were high but you know coming out of ohio state you know what was weird is a lot of pressure at ohio state because i was going to, i didn't realize i was going against guys well like joy was on that team he got drafted to seattle i didn't realize i was going against all pro guys <laughs> while i was in college right so when I stepped into the field and practice and to get against the guys in Seattle, it was almost like I had already been playing at a high level at Ohio State. I was used to stars, you know. Right. I got, I, my, my teammate was Orlando Pace, the first pick. I was a true freshman. Big Daddy Wilkins was the first pick on our team. Corey Stringer was on our team. Ricky Dudley was on our team. So to me, I was already played at, at the Big Ten level where – and playing against guys like Tim Black, Matuka, Wheatley, Charles Woodson was at Michigan. You know what I mean? So I had already played against Amani Toomer, who played for the Giants, and, you know, who's at Michigan, and, you know, Ron Dane and the guys at Wisconsin, and Tom Brady was at, yeah, at Michigan, you know, him and Greasy. So I felt like I'd already kind of – I wasn't shocked by, I guess we'll say, by the names, right? Right, exactly, because you were there, you you faced it. Was Brady that good when he was in Michigan? I mean, he wasn't the guy you saw, right? 
No, but he was splitting time. He was still splitting time with Greasy at the time, but you could tell he was good. He just had the raw skill that he brought to the to the field. Yeah. Yeah, was you he, play quarterback. At that era, you played quarterback in Michigan, you're pretty good, right? Yeah, I would say so. I would say so. So let's, we, not, get, let's not go too far. Let's not give him too much credit, but you know, <laughs> you know, the school up north. Let's not give him too much credit. Seriously, I'm I'm curious to see how he does down in Tampa because they now have surrounded him with a bunch of superstars down there. So it's going to be interesting to see if he's going to play like a 43-year-old or if he's going to play like he did when he was up in New England early on. Uh, I think he's going to be pretty good. Well, you would know better than I would because you played against the man. Uh, <laughs> so who was impactful initially on you right out of the gates at the professional level? Because you really – your game was very special when you got to Seattle. Who, who, who made that instant impact on you? Uh, a guy named Willie Williams. Most people know him. He played for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yes, and he sir. was over at Seattle. He played on the opposite side of uh, Rob Woodson when he was in Pittsburgh. Ended up playing about 15 years in the league. And the reason why Willie was so impactful to me because I was athletic, six foot, can run, no, you know, had all the athletic skills. And we are practicing, and they're throwing at me, and they're throwing at Willie. And, but he's coming up with picks, and he's making plays. And I'm just like, how is this guy making plays like this? Like, <laughs> you know, and, you know, not the biggest guy, not the fastest guy, but he's always making plays. And one of the things I learned from Willie Williams, Willie Williams taught me how to read patterns, taught me the game. Like he was the first person to say, you know, I learned this from Ryan Woods and those guys. So Willie Williams kind of put me on and taught me. You still have a relationship with Willie? Because he just lives yeah. down there in Montgomery County. Yeah, he lives over. I, I need to call him thinking about it. He lives right over by the Montgomery County Mall, and I need to call him. But Willie Williams is a guy who really helped me. I, I know uh, his buddy that he coached with at Churchill High School in Montgomery County, Chris Samuels, is at my high school now, Coach, and he's running the offense over there. So it's it's kind of neat that uh, they're bringing it back to the high school level and doing some good things there. Um, yeah. Talk, do, do me a favor. Talk about your Springs for Life Foundation that you started once you entered the league. You, you do some great things for young people. Um, why did you choose the at-risk youth? Yeah, because, because you know what? You know – it was something that was near and dear and passionate to my heart because especially being a young black man coming out of the Washington, D.C. area, I know how hard it was, you know, how hard it is for people, you know, people, especially the people of color or kids in the cities to try to make it out and at risk, risk or underprivileged. And I just wanted to get back. You got nominated as the Walter Payton uh, Player of the Year for your team twice. So what, you were with uh, Seattle and Washington when that happened for you? Yeah. What's that nomination like? I mean, that's got to be through the roof. Well, I think that's what you, you, the peers recognize you as being somebody who does a lot in the community. And, you know, just they understood that for me it was all about, you know, giving back. I, I go through life believing that it's all about providing service to others. And the more you can do and give back, I think you put that positive energy out in the world. I think that good things happen. Have you ever considered coaching since you want to give back? Have, have you gotten involved in that? Man, man, I coach, I coach my, you know, I had my Sean Springs football camp for six years. I coach my 13 year old <laughs> who barely listens to me. So, and I have two sons who play in college now where one plays at Georgetown, the other one's going to, he's not going to play football this year at University of Arizona, but uh, Pac-12 is not playing football. But, you know, I just try to get back in a different ways to is all it, the mental young kids. Is it disappointing for you to not see – um, uh, the Pac-12 playing and the Big Ten not playing. I mean, I know you're, I know you're a big guy. Uh, you want to see that happen. What do you think? I think, you know, we, we have to be smart. We have to understand the seriousness of the world we li we're living in today. Um, I think we have to be safe. And, you know, I, I'm not sure how you can effectively keep the kids safe and play sports without affecting, you know, everybody else. I don't know, man, and, and and I think it's up to the player's discretion, you know, but sometimes we just, the universities, they have to be smart.
Yeah, and I think most of them have been. I mean, yeah. I, personally, I'm excited to watch some football this weekend. I like the college game a lot. I'm sure you like the college game a lot because you got two young men uh, playing at that level. Uh, did you watch uh, Kansas City and Houston? I did watch it last night. I didn't watch all the game, man. It felt kind of different and weird to me, like <laughs> like, a, <laughs> like a scrimmage almost. But it was good to see him back out there, though. One of the things, well, maybe I was the only one felt like it was weird. It, I'm sure it does. I mean, I'm sure you're used to 60, 70,000 people packing the stadium and, and screaming for you from the time you were at Ohio State to the time you probably had a ton of people at, at Springbrook screaming for you because uh, I always enjoyed going down there to coach. But um, I, I guess one of the things that bothered me the most as I was watching it last night was when those guys got out there and they linked arms and uh, uh, you know, there were boos and people just didn't get it. Like, what do you think about that? Like, I, 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 you need to understand the bigger picture, the bigger message out there. That bugged me personally. How about you? Well, I, I, I think people need to understand that, you know, we live in a country where you, you have the right to express yourself. Right. <laughs> and, and I think that people need to be able to accept the fact that, you know, people do feel like, there's a need and they have a platform to, to express themselves because they feel like um, things aren't right. Things aren't fair. Uh, Black Lives Matter, um, or in this case, just inclusiveness, just everyone just being included. So if players want to express themselves, I stand behind them 100%. Yeah. Did, did you feel like you were um, in any way, shape or form? Did you feel like you if you wanted to do that when you were playing in the league, do you feel like you could have done that? Or do you think there would have been some um, some pushback on you? I, you know, what? I don't know. I, I, I think about that. You know, times are different. Um, and, and it, you know, I, I often wonder, you know, that question comes up, what would I have done? And um I, I don't know. I, I think, you know, probably everything else with those guys, I probably would have still with my teammates and, you know, and just, you know, just because I knew I had a platform and I had influence, I would have did what's best and what I felt was best. I was, and right now, I feel like that if you have a platform, you should, you know, express that, you know, there is injustice and there's the world we live in isn't fair right now. No, I, and I respect them using their platform in the correct way and, and getting their message across because right. all eyes are on them. And, you know, whether you want to accept it or, or, or whatever, there is a lot of crazy stuff going on in our country right now. Um, you went back to the Washington Redskins after your career with the Seattle Seahawks. Is this a dream come true? Honestly, was this, was this something you really wanted to do or was it going back to play for that legendary coach, Joe Gibbs, or what, what motivated you to go back to Washington? Well, you said that, right? You, you, I think you hit it on the hill. Coach Gibbs uh, and just playing for a legendary coach is one. But two, you know, growing up in the Washington, D.C. area, although my dad played for the Cowboys, I had a lot of respect for Washington because I grew up in the area and I know how these fans love their team. Yeah. Uh, the Washington football team now, we can no longer call them the, the other name, but uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? I can't get out of that groove. <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to, you know, come back home. Yeah. And, and that was a, that was a great move by you. Uh, did you get back to the community a lot when you came back home? Like, was it, you know, I, I mean, I, I know I watched Kevin Durant and one of the things I read about Kevin Durant was he really didn't want to come back home because he didn't want a bunch of people bugging him. And, and I kind of thought, well, there's got to be a line in the sand for you, young man. You still can come back and, and get back to your community. Did, did you get back when you came home? You know what? I, I tried to get back whenever I played the NFL or whenever I had an opportunity. Like I said, I, you know, I think that for much is given, much is expected, <laughs> you, you know, to get back. And I gave back through mentorship, donations, and supporting from continue to support at-risk youth to buying uh, crock pots every year for, you know, women in shelters to a lot of different things, man. And, and I never thought it as giving back. I just thought it as, you know, I guess to say the right thing to do is like, it's cool. I, I, it's people that when people are hurting and people in need and you have the means to, 
to help them, why wouldn't you do it? Sure. Did you see? I your, guess that's a better question. That was a, that was a great response. And did, did you see your dad doing the same things as he was in the league? Yeah, I think so. The Cowboys did a lot in the community, you know, especially around Thanksgiving and Christmas and stuff like that. And my dad would, you know, and all the Cowboys would buy kids toys and different things like that. So, yeah. Share a little bit about um, your experience when you went up to New England, that because that franchise really in the early 2000s turned the corner. Um, I can remember in the late, uh, what was it, 80s, where they got just absolutely throttled in their first Super Bowl. And then all of a sudden in the early 2000s, they turned a corner. Um, what attracted you to go there? What was it like playing up there? Because they really were early on in, the, in their run at the Super Bowls. Well, I think for me, you know, it was an opportunity to go play with Tom Brady. Um, you know, the thing that struck me when I went up there for a free agent, Tom was coming off his knee, and it was probably March 1st or you no know, snow on the ground. But Tom was already watching film, trying to get better, understand the game. So for me, it was like, how could you not want to join that? That level of greatness, man. Come on, man. <laughs> you know, it's inspiring, right? What what was it? What was it like playing under Belichick, though? Because oh, uh, and Coach Belichick was awesome. You know, he's pretty. You know, to the media is one way, but to the team, he's another way. And he was just, you know, he understood being a veteran. He rested you. He took care of you. He was just, you know, crack jokes at practice and stuff and things that you wouldn't think that come from Bill Belichick. But uh, he was. He was awesome. Because people see him in a different light. You know, they, they just see the very, you know, very docile and cut off hoodie sleeves, which I, <laughs> I personally love that about the guy because when I coach, that's the way I coach. You know, I just go yeah. there, whatever. Uh, and then he's from just down the road in Maryland in Annapolis. So, you yeah. know, I mean, that had to have some, some impact on the way you could approach him. What do you think about the style of the game today? What do you think the NFL needs to – I mean, they've lost a lot of viewership, and and it needs to change in some way to bring a lot of those people back. What's your thoughts on that? I mean, they said last night they had like 20.5 million people watch the game. Last year, the first game of the year, there were 22 million. So the viewership keeps dropping off. Where do you see the differences in the league right now? In that perspective? Well, I think, you know, the game is exciting. The new way where, you know, you got some exciting young players in the NFL, Patrick Mahomes, Deshaun Watson, Dak Prescott, Russell Wilson, still got some old dogs like, you know, the Aaron Rodgers, Tom and Drew, Phillip Rivers can throw them in there. Saquon Barkley. So I can keep going on a list of the, the guys who are stars in the league. I think that, you know, the viewership has changed mainly because the access and way you can review the game now. You know, when I was growing up, you know, it was like Monday Night Football, right? Like, and that was it, right? You go, every, you, you know, you trying to like beg your parents that you're going to be all right on Tuesday because you wanted to stay up and see the Raiders play the Steelers, right? Absolutely. And, 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 and now you got 30s, Thursday night football, Saturday night football, Sunday night football, college football, but more so, but people might be streaming in a day later or watching it on Twitter, YouTube. So I think people are still watching it. The game is still great. I think the NFL has done a wonderful job how they continue to keep it fresh with new commercials. And, and you just love, love the, the way that these guys are now they're true superstars in the league now, right? And and it's still team guys, and it's still by the team. But man, we got some guys that you know you can recognize. You know, you know what Odell Beckham looks like. Let me tell you, besides a quarterback, that's what I meant to say. You know, yeah. there's guys you can recognize besides a quarterback nowadays, which is pretty cool. Yeah, because that for the longest time, I mean, that you're right. It was the quarterback or like the superstar out on the field was the guy that you were able to recognize. I mean, if you had to pick a couple guys today that are the face of the NFL, who would you pick? Old dogs aside, guys that are going to take them into the next century, who are a couple of guys you would think are, are able to do that? We saw two last night, Deshaun Watson and Patrick Mahomes. Absolutely. You got to think Lamar Jackson is one of those guys. Absolutely. 
you got to love uh, the, the Ezekiel Elliott and the Saquon Barkley. Uh, you got to love this, the, the Bosa brothers. <laughs> How about that story? The, you know, the Nick and Joey, I mean, the 49ers. And you have to just think, you know, there's always a new exciting player that you don't know about that comes out of nowhere. Like, like um, uh, I'm trying to think of the tight end from 49ers. I love that guy. He, he's oh, a stud. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, you know, not knowing about him, the him and Kelsey and those guys are the two best tight ends in the yep. league. And, you know, there's some studs in the league and Odell is there and Julio is there and, 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 and D hop is there. So, there's some, there's some guys. How about um, how about the kid running the ball last night for Kansas City? Oh, oh. little dude is special. He's special. And he was great at LSU. I don't know how many yards he ended up with, but he was special. They were comparing him last night to Maurice Jones-Drew. What yeah, you- I can see that. I can totally see that. I mean, I, I was kind of like, wow, that's, uh, that's an interesting comparison. He's got a long way to go because – you know, MJD was a super player in his day. And, and hey, Coach, you don't give no rookies no break, man. You make them earn it, Coach. You make absolutely. them earn it, Coach. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, um, who do you like going to the Super Bowl this year? Who, who do you think? Who's going to? Oh, man, we're we keeping it real on, uh, on, on tonight, aren't we? You, you, yes, you we jump are. right to it, man. Yeah. You ain't, even, you ain't even give me three games into the season to make my predictions. No, nah, it's going to be cut and dry. There's no preseason. So we can't base it off of the, the young bucks that are going to help a team, right? So we got uh, – you, you, know you know who I like? You know who I like? I'm going to say it's Kansas City again. It's Kansas City again. But would I be, would I be a, a, a sore loser to go with Kansas City and San Fran in a rematch? No, nah, you wouldn't be. You wouldn't You be. sure, man? I mean, man, I like both of them. How you like Drew Brees, though? You think Drew's got something to say about that? I think Drew's is going to have something to say about it, but that 49er put together a special team, and, you know, they added a few pieces there. You know, you got Trent Williams over there protecting the quarterback. I mean, I mean, you, you think about that team, they're pretty good. I can't wait to watch them square off with your old squad, Seattle. I think, I think Russell will have something to say about that. Well, my, the problem with Seattle, man, the problem with Seattle, I think Russell is great, and they, they made some uh, pieces. But I, I just think, you know, with San Fran's defense, man, and the way they're just a physical team, Damn how bad. do you – I mean, they you, you, you see a run where team is built right. They built right. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I have not seen that kind They of built pretty good, right? Oh, the speed on that defensive line is unreal. I can't ever remember in all my years of watching football, and I've been watching since I was five and able to retain it. I never remember a defensive line coming after it like that. Never. never. Well, you might – you might have to be careful when you when you think about the, the 85 Bears. Yeah, the, right? they were good, but these guys coming off the edge, though. I mean, I, you know what? No, I thought one at you. I thought the Giants, the team that beat the Patriots that year, were OC, uh, Michael. Yeah. Uh, who else are they? Uh, well, uh, they had some studs. There was about three or four of them that were special up front. Right. I just – I don't know. The, the speed on this team – uh, across the board, across the board is, is pretty phenomenal. But you still got to put points on the board, too, in San Francisco. And a lot of people are buying into Garofalo. And, you know, that, that makes it. Well, yeah, well you, don't have to, you don't have to buy into the quarterback when, when, when you can run and, and pound people to sleep. Yep, you're right. You're right. I'm going to give you that. We talked a lot of football already. T- tell me about Wimpack. What, what's going on with, with your company, Wimpack? I want to know about that because you got some good things going on in the safety business. Yeah, man. Quimpact, we're a technology and material science company that, you know, we focus on analysis, design, and integration of impact protection solutions, meaning basically think of us as the padding solutions for football helmets, military helmets, uh, interior of cars and vehicles. So, you know, we, we, you know, we doing our part to, you know, make the world safer and uh, we grind and got a great, great group of young engineers, designers, and scientists. And we just trying to do some good things out there. 
you, you put in extra hours getting that going on. Are they using your technology and the football helmets of the NFL take away some of these concussions? Because, you know, a handful of years ago, um, well, maybe not that many, maybe four or five years ago, they were talking about the, the degree of the concussions and how impactful it was. I mean, yeah, we, we, we worked with the NFL. We won three awards with the NFL. We've got some pride. We're working with Shen on some interior uh, padding systems for helmets. Uh, well, you can see our products on the market in baseball. If you want football or baseball, we didn't test any football helmets this spring because obviously there was no spring football to really test them, man. So next year, probably see some helmets on the market. But baseball, you can watch the, the catcher's mask and you can watch a few games and see our uh, uh, products on the market. What's your end result from your company, though? What would you like to see happen with this company? You know what? Right now, I just got my head down to grow a great brand. And if it turns into something special, I'll be happy. But most importantly, you know, it's it's a cool to be able to, you know, build a business and provide a service to others. Sean, let me ask you this. What does grown-up Sean Springs tell high school Sean Springs if you were to go back and talk to you? Along Stay away from Stay away from the girl. <laughs> <laughs> that's impossible. Come on, man. You know that's not an easy thing to do. You know that's not an easy thing to do. You know. Yeah, man. I mean, you got the grades. You obviously got the grades. You you did well in college. I mean, your career is spoken for itself. When are they going to come knocking at the door for the Hall of Fame? I don't know, man. I think the Hall of Fame, I, I've, I'm on the list of Hall, Hall of Fame. But I'm not sure if I had a Hall of Fame career because I think it's, it's the Hall of Fame is also tied to winning. And I, one thing I regret about my NFL career, I, I was never able to win a Super Bowl or play in a Super Bowl. One of my favorite things about you was when you led the team in what, interceptions and sacks one year? Yeah, I did that. I think I'm the only defensive back to ever do that, man. You may be the only defensive back ever to do that. You were so unique out there, just a big body, a big presence who, who went and got it. If you didn't play in the NFL and you weren't a football player, what might you have done with your life? I'd have been an architect, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to be an architect growing up. Wow, that's kind of neat. Did you take classes doing that at uh, – uh, Ohio State or? I took them out of high school and then took business classes in college. Very nice. All right. So I do this segment called Decade Definers. We're going to define your decade with the top five receivers you faced when you were in the league. Can you give them to me? Uh, any particular order or what? I mean, I mean, if you want to go from, from least to best, it's on you. But no, I just want to hear your top five receivers you covered. Uh, number uh, that no particular order: Jerry Rice, Randy Moss, Jimmy Smith, Marvin Harrison, Larry Fitzgerald. Jimmy Smith, that's an interesting one. Yes, what sir. Made, what made him so unique? Special man. He's like Jerry Rice. Man ran everything full speed. He was strong. He was fast. I'm going to be honest with you, man. Jimmy Smith is probably one or two for me. He's probably one of the more underrated receivers to ever play in the league, too. Unbelievable. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you, man. Unreal. Unreal. I, I can't say nothing about Jimmy Smith. And how about Larry Fitz? He's still playing. And he's still doing well. Uh, my man Fitz, he came in the league. He used, to, he used to chase me around and ask me questions how to get better, man. He's still getting it done. He's a great guy. He, he's done nothing but, but, but put big numbers up and be a great person for the league. Hey, I want to thanks for, thank you for coming on the podcast. Okay. Today. It's been great. Uh, I, again, I'd like to thank Sean Springs for coming out here. Anytime, man. Anytime, man. It's been very insightful and exciting to hear your, your takes on the league today and uh, talk about your career going forward. Uh, my fingers are crossed that you, you get that call for the Hall of Fame at some point in the not so distant future. Thank you, brother.